Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third meeting in a series entitled Irish Literary Milestones. Today we have with us a writer and a celebrity, Colm Trebin, who truly represents the said Irish literary milestones. Welcome uh, again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before I introduce the work of our guests, let me introduce my co-organizers, uh, Mr. Krzysztof Schramm, who is the Irish Honorary Vice Consul, and uh, Justyna mazurek Schramm, the Vice President of the Irish Literature Foundation, who will deal with the chat questions. I am also really pleased to uh, welcome Mr. Dominic Berkeley from the Irish Embassy uh, in uh, Warsaw and uh, my friends from Nicholas Copernicus University um, from Toruń, uh, especially Professor Mira Buchholz, but also uh, her colleagues. Um, my friends from uh, Polish Association for Irish Studies, Professor Leszek Drong is uh, here with us and I've seen a list. Uh, there are also other members of our association uh, present. Um, I'd like to welcome my friends and colleagues from the Faculty of English Adam Mickiewicz University, as well as our students and high school students who join us monthly in celebrating Irish literature. I would like to pass greetings from the Vice Rector and Head of the School of um, Languages and Literatures here at Adam Mickiewicz University, Professor Katarzyna dziubalska kowaczek who is a linguist, but who, who wholeheartedly regrets that she can only join us. Uh, and I know that she does because she read our guest's work. I'm also privileged to extend greetings uh, from the Dean of the Faculty uh, of English, Professor Joanna Pawelczyk, who asked me to thank our guest for agreeing to meet us and uh, wished us all enjoyment in this great experience. Long time ago, when I was teaching the master, one of my students in his book report included a short remark addressed to me. This was really unorthodox. The comment stated, Professor, this is a really, really good novel. I'm in awe of Comte Bean's writing, end of quote. I couldn't agree more. To quote from the master again, life is a mystery and only sentences are beautiful. So let us talk and see what and how Kontoibin sentences speak to us here in Poland in the year 2020, uh, 2022. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kontoibin, and I can't uh, not say it live from Los Angeles. Well, welcome. Uh, and if we could clap, uh, there would be a a uh, heartfelt and long uh, clapping of welcome. Now, because I really want our students to see what kind of celebrity, what kind of a writer uh, we uh, have with us today. Let me just uh, show uh, very briefly uh, the, um, uh, the works that we will be talking about, uh, the novels, but also uh, other, um, uh, other texts. I'd like to uh, um, also thank my um, MA students, uh, especially Carolina Venswasta, who's responsible for, uh, for the background for this uh, presentation. Um, yes, here with us from Los Angeles, across the waters, uh, Mr. Colm Toybin, and I'm just going to uh, talk very briefly um, about uh, him because of course he, uh, it's not really uh, my introduction to his, his biography, but because uh, families are important for the lives uh, in the lives of writers. So that's why uh, the, there's going to be just a couple of, uh, of information uh, about his uh, life and work, edited work, novels and short stories, essays and uh, biographies. Uh, Eddie Scorthy uh, County Wexford is of importance because that would be my first question uh, connected also with another writer, uh, Anthony uh, Cronin. His grandfather, Patrick Toybin, participated in the Easter Rising in April 1916 and was then uh, a interned in Wales. Um, um, our guest held a number of really important positions. Um, he spent quite some time in uh, Barcelona before returning to uh, Dublin and was also the um, editor of the monthly news magazine Magill. Um, 
He is currently employed at the uh, Columbia University, and I have a very long list of awards, uh, honorary doctorates, uh, including Cohen Prize for Literature in 2021, and all the short lists to uh, the Booker Prize, uh, but that would take another 20 minutes if I wanted to uh, enumerate uh, all of these, uh, all of our guests' uh, activities. Uh, so just uh, let us start with the edited work. Um, I do you really uh, uh, admire this, um, the edited work on our other Irish scholars, because it's not only uh, his own work, his own novels, his own essays, but also the promotion of other writers. And this is very clearly seen in these three uh, um, collections here, but uh, also a very interesting collection uh, of documents on the Irish famine novels uh, with the um, most recent one at the magician short story collections uh, two uh, mothers and sons the empty family the short stories um some of his short stories are more frequently uh, anthologized than uh, others a priest in the family is certainly one of the most famous of uh, the stories. Um, travel narratives, and I would like to come back to them uh, when we will uh, be talking uh, uh, about uh, your work. Um, so uh, a work along the Irish border, homage to Barcelona, uh, the sign of the cross. This is a, a text which uh, um, also includes some uh, reminiscences from uh, 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 in stay in Poland. Uh, biographies and essays, um, the biography of Lady Gregory, a uh, story uh, of um, a life and work of Elizabeth Bishop, and essays on uh, writers. Uh, this is especially interesting because it talks about how families really influence uh, the lives and also the work, work of other uh, writers. And uh, because I do uh, want to quote from uh, essays on Henry James uh, the, with a wonderful title, All a Novelist uh, Needs, and uh, a screenplay to uh, this uh, 2017 uh, movie, which was co-authored uh, by uh, our guest. Uh, film adaptations, I heard that there are more. Uh, these are the two uh, that uh, are probably the most well-known, uh, The Blackwater Lightship and Brooklyn. And to be published in 2023, a guest uh, at the feast. This is a collection of essays. Uh, now to uh, our students, whatever you take, uh, whatever book about Irish literature you take, including the Oxford Companion uh, by Robert Welch, or the uh, Cambridge uh, History of Irish Literature, or any uh, work, uh, any critical work on uh, Irish uh, fiction, then of course, uh, Colm Tevin's name is there. So just Please be as much in awe as I am uh, right now. And uh, uh, let's appreciate and enjoy the fact that our guest um, accepted uh, our invitation. Uh, this is just the immensity of work. I pulled out all the books uh, that I had on shelves and just decided to show you all of them uh, as, the, as my last plug. Okay, without further ado, I have 20 questions, although we probably won't have time to uh, talk about uh, everything um, I would love to talk about. Uh, but uh, let's start uh, with uh, my last question and reverse the order. So let's talk about writing, reading, memory, and then if we have time uh, about uh, literary history. So, um, you dedicated your collection of short stories, The Empty Family, to Anthony Cronin, with whom you share uh, the place of birth, and Corthy. But having read your biographical uh, works, such as Love and Dark Time, Gay Lives from Wild to Almodovar, uh, or New Ways to Kill Your Mother, for example, it seems that you also share a kind of effortless wit, uh, which in Polish um, we express as having a light pen. Are there any other connections that you would like to share with us be for, between you and uh, Anthony Cronin, whose work we also celebrated uh, during one of the um, literature festivals uh, here in Poznan 20 years ago, guys? Um, 
Thank you very much for that, Liliana. Um, just to say, um, my mother um, left school at 14 and she had to go and do a typing and shorthand course. And her teacher for shorthand was Anthony Cronin's father. And she had been up to then only been taught by nuns. And suddenly this really nice man who, you know, she liked enormously. Mm -hmm. And um, in the um, Penguin book, of Irish poetry there was a poem by Anthony Cronin called for a father for his father mm -hmm. and he speaks at the end of the poem that the son learns to do various things his father did and ends with and smile with his slow hesitant smile and my mother used to point it out said that is exactly what Mr Cronin had he had a slow hesitant smile so that was one of my first introductions to the idea mm -hmm. of a poem that came from a from a sort of truth and that um, something that was very close to us, you know, and uh, so that that's the first thing. The second thing would be, you know, people of that generation in Ireland, I mean, people born in the 20s or 30s who tended to be pretty pompous, pretty dull, um, you know, really self-regarding. And they were very, you know, you just avoided, basically you just avoided older people on the base. They were just, just yeah, not listening to this, except for Anthony Cronin. Mm -hmm. And everyone talks about this. Everyone of my generation talks about just what good company he was, how open to life he was, and um, how original he was, and how not self-regarding, not pompous, and forward-looking. And um, if you if you were in, and people do talk about this, if you were in a room and he was in the room, you go over towards him to see what he was saying. Mm -hmm. And um, he, he was, I have to say, also, I suppose, very... Um, I mean, I mean, he didn't um, he didn't suffer from great self-regard, but 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 also he tended not to really have a lot of, you know, I suppose he wasn't in awe of anybody of any sort of power, you know, mm -hmm. from Catholicism to, you know, to other forms of power, especially literary power. Mm -hmm. I have people who, no matter what you would say, so and so is a great writer. He'd say, "Well, hold on." A, he'd always say, "Hold on a moment." <laughs> so that's really what my relationship with him was. Yes, I, I remember uh, I was quoting uh, that uh, last time that we met um, uh, during the meeting of the Irish Literary Milestones. Uh, Cronin said that he wanted, uh, he, he for some reason, he was about to be a barrister, uh, but that uh, profession didn't really work well with this idea that he was a poet and he was going to be a poet. And so he decided to leave uh, his job to become a poet. Uh, but he was pretty affluent. And then again, that didn't work with his image of a poet who should be suffering and um, and uh, being poor and, 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 and such things. And this distance, uh, that he showed in his writing and to himself and his writing was really uh, quite uh, quite interesting and quite incredible uh, when we met him and he was in Boston three times. Uh, so uh, we did, those who uh, had the privilege to uh, meet him had uh, quite some time to to know him as a uh, as a person, as, a, as really someone, someone who's fun to be with and to talk uh, about uh, literature, also other people's uh, writings. Back to you, however, uh, Lady Gregory's toothbrush. Uh, this is the book. Uh, this is the book here. Uh, the students are forced to see. Uh, is a biography. Uh, there's a short story called Silence uh, in the Empty Family. Is fiction, both featuring uh, Lady Gregory's affair with the poet William Scallon Blunt, revolving around the sonnets that uh, she wrote and asked him to publish under his name. The Master is the story of Henry James, and The Magician narrates the life and work of Thomas Mann. All of the above mentioned works cater to the contemporary fascination with biofictions. The, uh, so how do you find, and I quote again, all that novelist needs? How do you find topics? How do you find uh, characters, figures in literature that you would be interested in exploring in your fiction? Um, I, I think in the case of James and Thomas Mann, it begins with that funny period that anyone who's a reader has aged about 18 or 19. When you start to read books for yourself that are not on a course mm -hmm. and that have a big effect on you. And everybody can remember that there was some book that really mattered. And sometimes those books go out of fashion, you know, and but you're still reading 
D.H. Lawrence, for example. And right. I think Kafka has a big effect on some people. Mm -hmm. And um, so does Dostoevsky. Um, and um, I was reading both Henry James and Thomas Mann, and I presumed then that writing came from power, it was a form of entitlement, mm -hmm. arose from certainty and stability. The author's photograph, the author's name, the whole sense of completion in a book. Mm -hmm. But it was, of course, later really reading about Virginia Woolf's life, realizing this is all rubbish. This is it's completely untrue. There's instability, uncertainty, lack of entitlement, a sense of nervousness, a sense of unease in the world, that all these things nurture a novel much more than power or certainty. And in the case of Henry James and Thomas Mann, See, in the case of Thomas Mann, his diaries, which really appeared 25 years after his death, that mm -hmm. they really made clear just how uneasy he was in the world. And in the case of Henry James, the more we learned about him through biography, the more we learned what, what again, what an uneasy mm -hmm. figure he was. And in the case of both, you, you have also, of course, uh, sort of closeted homosexuality, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, that, that you really have to study. I mean, there's some people who still think, oh, stop writing, you know, stop queering Thomas Mann. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. he wrote this, that is, I didn't write, he wrote the diaries. So, mm -hmm. so, so the, there is, there's, but, but that is the only one of the ambiguities and it's ambiguities I'm interested in. So in other words, if, if in the case of someone like James Joyce, George Eliot, Oscar Wilde, I'm, I'm, there's too much certainty for me, too much certainty about sexuality, mm -hmm. but other things. Whereas with James and Mann, there's a mystery, there's hiddenness, there's a sort of withholding, there's ambiguity, and I could work with that. Um, thank you very much. That's uh, that's certainly very interesting. That uh, the the um, idea of ambiguities that are, that are more interesting than uh, somebody parading uh, um, in front of uh, the reader, like. Uh, uh, Oscar Wilde, who I, I, we just talked about in class, that he's pretty much everywhere now uh, for some reason. That that his uh, that his work uh, comes back through uh, other uh, writers' work, including yours. Now, non-fictional, ways to kill your mother, and mad, bad, and dangerous to know. And I love the chapters, the, the titles of the chapters. The one that points to Lytton Stretchy, <laughs> the one that uh, points to uh, um, uh, John Millington Singh, and uh, the three tenors, the two tenors, not the three tenors. Um, they the these uh, works, the books of essays, present the importance of families in writers' lives, and. Uh, I really, I was in awe when I was reading the story how Jim Joyce and his brother Stanislaus, each in their different way, um, looked at their at their father and um, immortalized their father in uh, in their works. Uh, likewise, uh, they point to the ongoing need to reread history. Do you see your own work as part of this trend to demythologize such bronze figures, Irish literary milestones? Or perhaps it's the other way around. It's to immortalize them again, but from a different perspective. <laughs> I, I, I think demythologizing is a very big word. I, I was really just looking at the available facts and seeing what I could do with them. And, and there is really something interesting about the relationship between James Joyce and his father, especially in the novel Ulysses, where we have all the information we need from Stanislaus, the brother. He mm -hmm. wrote these two books and it really makes his father out to be a drunken monster and a bully at home, this charming man in a pub, and he would go home and make a nuisance of himself and his family were hungry. And this is in Ulysses in a certain moment where the daughters, I mean, the Stevens, Dedalus' sisters really have mm -hmm. no food. And one of them wants to buy a French book. And you can see there's sort of hunger for learning. But Joyce decided not that, that if he were going to describe his father's drunkenness at home, he was going to lose Ulysses. Somehow or other, Ulysses needed to soar above that sort of, um, in a way, um, dealing with, with um, domestic life. The domestic life in the book is, is Leopold Bloom not going home. Stephen Dedalus not going home. Both of them, therefore, are wandering the city. Mm -hmm. And what he gives his father, instead of dramatizing his father's badness, he, mm -hmm. he operates generously. He loses his grievance. And he gives mm -hmm. his father this wonderful apotheosis where he sings this most beautiful song in the most beautiful way um, in the hotel with everyone awed and listening. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And that is the, the moment he gives his father. And I think that movement from the, the temptation must have been there to have a vicious domestic scene. Mm-hmm. And instead he gives his father, he, he sees his father at his very best. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that is an opening up of the imagination that would allow other things to enter, such as indeed the great stylistic experimentations and the general comedy of Ulysses. But it's, it's, it's just one idea, but I, I would hesitate to say that it's anything large. I just looked at the available information and saw what I could do with that, which I think is probably a better way of approaching an essay than trying to find some sort of large concept mm-hmm. and trying to apply it to, you know, facts and, and um, information. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you very much. Um, I uh, agree with everything uh, you say, but I'm still, I, I love the way you, uh, I've never thought about uh, the uh, Joseph's work in this way, and I never really did the comparison between um, his way of uh, writing his father and Stanislaw's uh, way of writing his father. But of course, this interest in Joyce comes back with uh, with Nora, um, the, the figure of Nora, with uh, Nola Connor uh, winning the uh, One Dublin, One Book. So uh, it's all about uh, going back and perhaps rereading the things that we know and looking at them uh, from a different perspective. And speaking about that, uh, this uh, short story, A Priest in the Family, uh, which uh, was also anthologized in the Granta Book of Irish Short Story, uh, which was edited by Anne uh, Enright. Uh, This is a story that talks about pedophilia in uh, the church. So... uh, Speaking from the perspective of when you wrote it um, and now, um, is there anything that changed in this perception? Because it was, I keep telling the students, this is quite a brave story to, to publish in Ireland, which is so much like Poland with the, in respect to, to the, the position of the church. But yet you published in the, the uh, short story before it's, the, the problems in the church are open for public discussion. So is there anything that changed? What, what is your perspective now on that, um, on the text? Uh, yeah, I, I just say it, it wasn't really very brave. I mean, you, you know, the, in Ireland, there really wouldn't be a problem about publishing a story and there was nothing nobody criticized it. It was absolutely, you know, it wasn't, it really, really wasn't brave. Um, and, I was interested in what Henry James had talked about in the American Civil War, that in his early stories, he is really, he is actually writing during the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. And instead of writing about the battlefield, he's writing about what happens at home. And in one of the stories, he even apologizes. He's saying that what he's interested in is the reverse side of the picture. So, So in other words, some other novelist will write about the actual victims Mm-hmm. and the actual institutions. And what I wanted to do was just move the camera over to the side and imagine, for example, you're looking at a photograph of a court, people coming out of a court, and just as one person mm-hmm. over to the side, you wonder, I wonder who that is. Not the main, not the perpetrator, not the victim, just someone to the side. And I wonder if fiction is better sometimes. Journalism, of course, the job of journalists is to be in the middle to, to mm-hmm. write the story. Historians to, can do that later sociologists, anthropologists, but the novelist's job is to see if there's some angle you could move towards and look at it from there. And so um, there was a case at home where I'm from that wasn't pedophilia, but it was sexual harassment in the workplace. Mm-hmm. But, it was, uh, but I knew the mother of the person who was accused. And I realized how hard it was going to be for her Mm-hmm. You know, that she was very proud of her son and her children and she would be walking the town every day. And just after this, people, she would know that some people were, you know, that she would, people would talk to her about, about everything except that. Mm-hmm. So I began to think, ha, huh, that's an, that idea of getting, a, first of all, you get an old woman. First thing you do is make her independent. Mm-hmm. She, her hearing is perfect. Her sight is perfect. She, she drive a car like she's she's not in any way feeble and she's not deeply religious. So you get all the things you associate with an old woman in Ireland. You move them over to the side and you get someone much more interesting than that. I mean, my mother was like that. Her friends were like that. They were serious people who played bridge and read the papers and, you know, and they did this into their 70s, early 80s. And so that's that's the first thing. Second thing is then you you bring it in slowly, you know, mm-hmm. that. 
and then you you're mm -hmm. moving always towards the confrontation mm -hmm. between the mother and the abuser and the thing you have to do is that this is that if if i if i were writing a brazilian soap opera there would be <laughs> screaming shouting every time or indeed an irish soap opera every type of shouting and screaming and everyone but what if when the sun comes nothing or almost nothing and I think that almost nothing, that they don't know what to say to each other. So it's all about toast and butter and all, it's about everything except the thing. And so the story moves then in that sort of, I suppose, poetic way in that you're getting half a phrase and the reader is getting a shiver from half the phrase. But so everything you're doing, is from the side, is the back of the picture, is an angle rather than a direct vision. Yes, we did. Well, we just read it with uh, um, some of my students and um, the a priest in the family, uh, it's not really about the priest, it's about the mother. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. that's yeah. Uh, precisely what it is, but it still remains a very, very powerful story. And I still think that it was uh, a, a brave uh, thing to uh, write about an incredibly interesting and an incredibly interesting way, which didn't really age. So that also is uh, a quite an, uh, and it remained quite an important story. Um, right. So uh, this is uh, one of these uh, stories, as I said, that, that are frequently anthologized. Now let's talk about the uh, story of the night, the Blackwater uh, Lightship, and uh, then the Heather Blazing. The story of the night um, and the Blackwater Lightship talk about uh, homosexuality. Heather Blazing is about personal trauma uh, bound with national um, uh, trauma. Uh, all of these three um, talk about, in a way, everyday life in Ireland and elsewhere, Argentina, in the in case of the story of the night. Now, if we believe in what James could say, uh, says about uh, all autobiography being fiction and all fiction being autobiography, is there anything from your own life that you, well, of course, that you want to share with that, that uh, is in these novels? Uh, what was important to you at the time when you were publishing them, uh, writing them? Uh, this is late 1990s, so this is a different world. And I'm asking this question, uh, for the benefit of the students, because this is the kind of uh, uh, generational difference that they uh, wonder what the VCR was, uh, 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 which is mentioned in the priest of the family. So, so yes. Yeah, so, for the benefit of the students, if you could share with us, uh, um, um, I think in the case of of the header blazing, a great deal of it is autobiographical. Now, when I say autobiographical, I mean that it's based on real houses. It's based on a real configurations within families, but um, I'm I'm one of five. In other words, I, ha I have four siblings, and my but my mother lived, you know, into her into her eighties. So, in the Heather Blazing, I simply remove all the siblings, and I remove my mother, and it's just me and my I father in the house. It's exactly what Thomas Mann did in Woodenbrooks. In Woodenbrooks. And, <laughs> and so, um, so, so I get it down. So it's like a child dreaming in bed. I wish I, had, I wish it was just me. So I get all the presents. And, um, you know, I, myself, my father would be really happy just together. We do the cooking. So it's, you're starting with that idea. Mm -hmm. So, and the house is absolutely our house. And the aunts and uncles, uh, all of that is absolutely real. But of course, the the years are different. So that some of the experiences are my father's and some are mine. So everything gets sort of shifted and connected. Um, but it is very much a real Enniscorthy. It is very much really our family. And just everything has just moved around a bit. And, and, and then, of course, the judge is fictional. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, his childhood is real or autobiographical or based on based on what happened. Mm -hmm. But he's obviously his marriage, his um, his time in the court is all fictional. And um, with the um, with the Blackwater Lightship, yes, some of the same things are there. We spent summers in that place on the Wexford coast. Um, so that all of that beach, the cliffs, everyone, I could show you every house and say, that's the house, you know, that's the house. So all of the topography is real. The house in the town is exactly the house from the weather blazing. So it's the same house again. But and but but what what I'm working with there is I'm I'm you know the um 
in the Oresteia, you have Clytemnestra, her daughter Electra, and the mm -hmm. son Orestes. So you have that idea of a daughter's anger against her mother mm -hmm. being Electra to Clytemnestra from the Oresteia, and mm -hmm. this brother coming back being Orestes, being Declan in the in the Heather. With, mm -hmm. with, with, with the story of the night, we're again back with um that idea of the reverse side of the picture where I, I covered as a journalist the trial of Galtieri and mm -hmm. the other generals in Buenos Aires in 1985. But I, I made a, a really conscious, deliberate decision that I would not write a novel set in the concentration camps or in the interrogation centers or in any place where the torture took place or the disappearances happened. Mm -hmm. I would write a novel in the aftermath. So it's all over. And Buenos Aires is denying it happened, slowly realizing it happened, mm -hmm. and people are living in a strange state of silence and silence being broken. And I realized um, that that was also happening in the sexual realm. It was certainly happening to gay people. In, in 1985, um, which is, I think, something that people in Poland and Ireland might recognize, we have that in common with Buenos Aires, there was no gay bar. There was no gay mm -hmm. identity, there was no gay culture, there was no, no mention of gay people in 1985 in Buenos Aires. So I had two things being denied, homosexuality and the disappearances. Now, to be careful not to, not to connect them too deeply, but nonetheless, um, the protagonist is, he's gay and he's someone who didn't see or just didn't think he saw Mm -hmm. what happened with the disappearances so yeah, i was I mean, working with those ideas with really back with ideas to do with um which i think comes in families about silence but about not recognizing something pretending something is not happening dramatizing that um i remember reading um the story of the night and i think i had the feeling of menace all the time uh so I guess that was intentional that you, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, the kind of I mean, the idea of menace figure. is, mm -hmm. yeah, the idea of menace was really part of life there in Buenos Aires. Um, and it, it lasted, even though, for example, the courtroom, the, the hearings went on until one in the morning and you walked out of the court uh, and the trains were going through the night still. Uh, mm -hmm. That stopped because it was costing too much money, but I would walk down through the, through the old city and, I mean, it was really eerie, strange, because some of the street names were some of the names that had been mentioned in the court during the day where bodies were found. I mean, five years earlier, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. it was all there for me as real. And the city of Buenos Aires as, a, as an eerie, um, I suppose, dangerous, dark place. And uh, it works. Um, honestly, it works for somebody who reads it from Poland, not knowing anything. I've never been to Argentina. I've been to other uh, places in South Af um, America, but never to Argentina. So, so for me, it was real. Uh, it, the menace, the, the fear, the darkness, all was there. All was there. Um, but turning to uh, um, another uh, big subtopic, which is reading. So every writer is also a reader. And of course, you are one of the greatest. Uh, from um, Anna Elizabeth Bishop, we learned that you love uh, loved poetry uh you were and i love that scene when you uh say that you were copying uh wh auden's poems because you couldn't bring books to school and so you decided to to do handwritten copy something that our students would think it's just from another century but it was just such a wonderful uh image um you mentioned louis mcneese william empson tom gunn and sylvia plath now, um, whose poetry uh, is on your reading list now? Is there anyone that uh, you could recommend, anyone that you find interesting? Uh... Um, I suppose, um, the again, we're stuck with the idea that at, at 19 or 20, I was reading poetry and I'm still reading it. And um, that would be the poetry of W.B. Yeats, the poetry of Sylvia Plath, the poetry of Tom Gunn, the poetry of Elizabeth Bishop, the poetry of Robert Lowell. But I suppose in recent years um, in America, um, certainly um, I'm reading uh, um, the work of Louise Glick, for example. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a particular book of hers called The Wild Iris that I'm, um, that I'm, that I'm certainly reading. And um, she, she would be one of the new ones. Um, I'm reading John Ashbery. Um, 
yeah i i mean i i, I read poetry all the time and um so uh yeah i read anything really in poetry yeah. uh thank you it's uh it, yeah louis i don't know the uh the wild iris so that that is something that would be my stack of shame uh that is left for no, later yeah, 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 to uh, read. Um, the, the, you mentioned the House of Names, and of course, the Testament of Mary and the House of Names are based on uh, histories of Mary, uh, and mother of Jesus in the case of the former, uh, and uh, Agamemnon's son, Aristus, in the, um, in the case of the latter. So both are testimonies to the power of reading, because a writer is a reader. Uh, so what was the, uh, again, the inspiration behind uh, just sitting down and writing a novel about Mary. It's, it's an incredible uh, text, um, uh, the text that I usually come back to and I usually have uh, on my, uh, yeah, in my syllabus um, yeah, for, the, uh, for the seminars. So, um, and the House of Names, which is also such a, a striking text uh, with, the, with the classical background. So, uh, Yes, phenomenally interesting yeah. new takes on the well-known stories. How would you do well, it? Well, I think I think in the case of Mary, um, first thing is that um, in in poorer countries or countries that had been deprived of a sort of autonomy, um, <laughs> Ireland, Poland, perhaps Mexico, perhaps mm -hmm. um, perhaps Portugal, um, Mary has a special place. Mm -hmm. And the fact that she was an ordinary woman who suffered a great deal, and then she became queen of heaven. That, that those two things, that those things seem to really matter to people, and that people are, are more content somehow praying to her than praying to God the Father, for example, or even praying to Jesus. Mm -hmm. And therefore, she said, the prayers, the Hail Mary, the Hail Holy Queen, the Memorare, those prayers are a very special place. And part of her power is her powerlessness. Mm -hmm. And her powerlessness comes in the form of silence. And so that is a most fascinating idea that since that her power comes from the fact she doesn't speak. So it's the iconography. Mm -hmm. And it's the iconography of silence. And um, so you, you think, what if that broke? What if you broke that? What would happen then? And... Um, so you think, well, you know, we're back with the idea that she's old mm -hmm. and that she speaks only once and that she needs to say what happened, mm -hmm. that she's been not saying it and not saying it and not saying it. And then she speaks. And mm -hmm. so you need a special tone, which is the tone of someone who will only speak once, which is a tone of someone who's not used to gossiping or not used to any form of small talk. There's no small talk in the book. There's no, it's all direct. It's all directed at you, the listener in the staccato tone. Mm -hmm. And so um, th that was very different in a way because I was working with something that I, I was really, uh, that I know so well that, you know, the hymns to Mary, all the statues of Mary, you go to Italy, you, you know, you live with the, the Pietà and, and the suffering figure at the cross and the Annunciation and mm -hmm. the, um, indeed the assumption and um so um that was and you know the problem you have always is if you're going to describe the crucifixion it's not a joke you know in other words you have to feel it you have to live it and so i had to go back to the roots of christianity mm -hmm. and look at the idea of the story of suffering and just trying to re basically retell it and that's what i was doing also with house of names i was getting a story that's so well told the story of Clytemnestra, mm -hmm. her daughter Electra, her husband Agamemnon. Mm -hmm. But I realized that there was a middle part of the story that of Orestes. Where was Orestes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, comes, he's, he's, he comes back from where? Mm -hmm. And that's not in any text. So I obviously those sort of gaps I thought I could work with while giving the, both his mother and his sister these voices, again, staccato, again, very, I suppose, um, tense, that I would give him a much gentler sort of tone in the story for narrative. But yeah, it's another retelling. So it's a sort of literary text in the same way as the man book and the master are literary texts. But then every so often I don't, some of the books are not literary texts, emphatically, you know, books about something else. 
um, I'm, I'm, uh, I've asked you about um, uh, House of Names because uh, a couple. Of, this is 2017, so of course this is quite recent. Uh, but um, I think around 2005 there was this whole uh, movement of writers retelling classical literature and uh, Margaret Atwood wrote about the, the Penelopead. Uh, Lindsay Clark wrote uh, the uh, War at Troy and the Return from Troy. Uh, Janet Winterson wrote Wait. Many writers were kind of involved with this project of uh, recalling, remembering, rereading, and rewriting uh, classical literature. Uh, but uh, nobody really touched the story of Orestes. That's true, that it's just there to be, it was waiting to be written. Uh, uh, but it's both uh, uh, the Testament of Mary and House of Names are about silence or silences yeah. Yeah. in in so many ways. And, and that, of course, is uh, quite fascinating. Um, it, and the last question about uh, reading, uh, I know that uh, there are two famous adaptations of uh, your novels, The Blackwater Lightship and Brooklyn. Now, um, of course, you wrote, uh, you co-wrote uh, the screenplay uh, for The Return to Montauk, but if you were to write, would you like to write uh, the screenplay to your own novel? And if so, which one would that be? If no, no, I won't do that. Um, uh -huh. I, I didn't write the screenplay for Brooklyn, mm -hmm. and I didn't write the screenplay for the for the Blackwater Lightship, mm -hmm. and I and I never regretted that. It, you, you, the pro first problem is you lose a year. Mm -hmm. The second problem is that no matter what you do, they want you to rewrite, and no matter what they want, they want you to change. <laughs> and so here you are, your own book that you put so much time into suddenly having to redo it for someone else because of course the money is the one who talks the money commands and you're better not to be there you're better not to be in the room mm -hmm. and not to be involved you're better to be writing some other book so no i won't i won't get involved in that okay well um i remember Kazuo Shiguro in one uh, of the interviews he said that he went to uh, when they were screening um, one of his novels and he said everybody was very polite but they he was just kind of in a way you know he was not helpful he was just there uh, on set and uh, they just wanted to get rid of him so you're probably yeah and um, there's a moment in the filming of the Blackwater Lightship when Angela Lansbury and the uh -huh. two other actresses have to come into a room and ha really have an amazing argument with each other. Mm -hmm. But I'm at the side watching. It's my only day on set. Mm -hmm. And it stops, just a cut. And the three actresses go out and see me, they go out and say, who is that guy? And why is he <laughs> staring at us like that? Because of course, I was amazed by the fact that my lines were being spoken in this way, were mm -hmm. being made so mm -hmm. real by these actresses. Mm -hmm. So the, the director said, I think you should just move so they can't see you. You're not in their side side, you know. And so I moved. Actually, I realized, like Ishiguro, I realized the best thing to do now is you go home. Just go home. <laughs> Yes, but uh, it would certainly be very interesting if you decided to write a script uh, uh, for uh, one of your own novels, but I, we do understand uh, uh, the, uh, that that might not be uh, of uh, interest. Um, so speaking about Mary, of course, uh, here in the Catholic Poland, uh, well, Mary, the Queen of Poland, uh, the uh, the um, a deity that uh, saved Poland from the uh, Swedish uh, deluge uh, in the 17th century. All of these myths are connected with uh, our identity as uh, Poles. But I remember that uh, in the sign of the cross, you describe your trip to Oświęcim in Krakow. Um, what would be, uh, it was some years ago, but what are the most vivid memories of Poland? Could you share uh, with us some of your impressions? Uh, they're varied uh, in these two uh, books of uh, um, the travelogues. Well, I suppose that, um, you know, part of the problem for someone like me is that, that I read countries through its writers. So, of course, um, I would have known, I mean, I'm, I mean, I know the work of Miwash, um, mm -hmm. including his prose work. And, of mm -hmm. course, um, I knew um, um, Adam Zagievsky. And so here I am in Krakow. And uh, I suppose also um, I, th th there was an extraordinary event in Chesterhova where John Paul II really at his most theatrical and his most spiritual, and his most strange, addressed a million young people. 
Mm-hmm. And that was something to see. And what was interesting was that young Polish people seemed to me to be going to see him. They mm-hmm. loved the spiritual part but they were not paying great attention to him about say the sexual you know sins or mm-hmm. like that they that, that there was a youth culture going on uh, and you couldn't say youth culture here john paul ii here that mm-hmm. the two of them that the, the youth could go to the event and then go back home and meet their girlfriend and play their guitar and you know smoke and mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. so there was there was there was a sense that, that i thought polish society um was very complex and I was interested in there's something else and just that was very interesting there I was staying in the Europejski hotel which is you know the old Europejski hotel mm-hmm. in Warsaw and I decided this is this is like 30 30 years ago but I decided I should go to a gay bar mm-hmm. on a Saturday night so I found out where it was but I realized that the gay community in Poland was very worried about tourists coming people with americans or Irish people with money you know with dollars and wallets mm-hmm. and that they could actually you know on on balance a very delicate new movement and so they were very very they were what they, they almost didn't want to let me in they said no this is for polish people i said but it's for gay people they said no no but you don't understand we just want ourselves here just to get slowly get them i thought that was terribly interesting now i know that there have been a lot of problems since because mm-hmm. Unfortunately, what's happened is that the word gay, being gay, has become associated, has become a really red rag for right wing movements in Russia, mm-hmm. in America, in Poland, in Hungary, in various other countries that they just say gay. And, and that's but it wasn't it wasn't like that in the early 90s in Warsaw. Mm-hmm. It was a growing movement. It was gentle. And, it, and there was no sense that, that it was going to be become a sort of. I suppose an object of hate in the way that that it later on did. So that 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 was really fascinating to watch how <laughs> thoughtful those people were, and uh, I should say I, they did let me in eventually, and it was a I mean it was a great place and there were people were you know it was a lovely feeling, but it was interesting just to watch the politics of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, I, uh, I remember uh, when you uh, when you say that you uh, perceive a country through uh, writers. I remember the fragment uh, when you talk about Miłosz's Vilnius, the uh, Vilnius that uh, Vilna that doesn't exist anymore, and yeah. uh, it was absolutely. Um, well, this is where you uh, face a great writing and a great writer. You, I knew this stuff. I knew Miwosh. I read it, but I never thought about it in this way. And also your observations of uh, Easter in Poland. I know Easter. <laughs> I'm Polish. I uh, even if I don't, uh, I'm not a practicing Catholic. Then I take my mother to church to see uh, the uh, display of uh, a Christ's grave, and I never, ever, ever thought about the fact that we go onto the altar and we make a great display of uh, Christ's grave at Easter, and we make a political thing out of the whole thing. It takes a great writer to remind you about all these. It was, that, that, was, that was a fascinating time. Yeah, I think it was 91, maybe. Yes, it's uh, 90 or 91. Easter do that. It's still yeah. Uh, yeah. something political. Yeah. But what was the most fascinating in the passage was that notice that in Ireland, the, the altar would be the ultimate limit that you don't do yeah. anything beyond the altar. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, that's I correct. Thought about yeah. it in this way. So yeah. it's kind yeah. of made me reflect back on my uh, own culture and my uh, own background. Yeah. I do want uh, uh, to uh, give the floor to um, our audience. But so one last question from me, since, well, obviously you've traveled, uh, you've spent quite some time in uh, um, in Barcelona, uh, and that is reflected in your uh, short stories uh, and uh, in the homage to Barcelona, in, in which you pay tribute to Catalonia, it's art and culture. How did it, uh, how does uh, this experience of travel and other countries influence your own writing? To, um, does it still, or was it more? Uh, it was it stronger in the past. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I yeah. suffer from curiosity, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I, when I was twenty, I thought I'd like to go. You know, I hadn't been out of the country really, and um, so I started, and uh, 
first place I stayed for three years so I, there, there were I think in anyone's life 20 to 23 you know we were talking earlier about you coming to Los Angeles you know yes. that you you actually do learn you 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 have um I think experiences that stay with you so the experiences mm -hmm. just that it happened that the General Franco the dictator died in two months after I arrived mm -hmm. so I had three years there where I was watching democracy growing mm -hmm. and it's one of the great I think it's one of the great experiences it's, it's experience that a lot of people in Poland have had for example that you watch the strange mm -hmm. ways that people drawing be, people become left wing or right wing or you know that watching that happen from mm -hmm. dictatorship is I think a gift if anyone's ever gets a chance to see it it's really really worth seeing it's worth witnessing but the sort of uh, grace or fire or whatever you get in people's eyes you know mm -hmm. But would it still be the, because of course for Joyce was uh, uh, exile, uh, was a way of uh, dealing with Ireland. So is it still um, this uh, um, kind of idea that immigration is, uh, is a path to freedom or self-imposed exile bringing misery to those left behind, which is- the Yeah, I think in small countries, I think if you ask anyone in Cuba, in Lithuania, in Ireland, the whole idea of holidays, of, you know, that's why Ryanair started, you know, because <laughs> Irish people desperately needed to get away cheaply. And um, so um, and they would go through all sorts of discomfort to do so, you know. Yeah, um, yeah we love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we love it and we hate it. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but um, the, you know, just I think it's a small country syndrome that you really do need to see, to get out. It, it's a constant sense of the horizon, the distant horizon being the one you want to see. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for one or two questions from the audience. So if you uh, would like to address uh, our guests, please do so uh, via chat. And uh, Justina will uh, take care of the questions. Uh, yes, we do have a question. So Justina, yes, uh, thank do. you. Thank you very, very much. I will uh, still show you a, a couple of questions. Uh, uh, pictures with Andrew McConnell as we always do just uh, uh just uh, two slides but that will be at the end of our meeting so yes okay so I will maybe pin myself as well not to be the voice from <laughs> from a background somewhere strange okay so um uh we have a question from I don't see the full name here I'm just uh, going to... yes okay thank you very much Liana for that uh thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us two questions if I may so maybe we're just going to start with one if the novelist's power is an illusion how do you deal with your own stories that try to control you do they invade your dreams <laughs> um I, just for me it's a simple thing it's called work and um, I need to do it. And if I do too much thinking about it, you know, in other words, I, something occurs to me, an image, a memory, and it moves into melody at some point, into rhythm. In other words, I get a first sentence. I get a beginning. I get a way of starting. And what I need to do then is work. And so you're, you, you're dealing, yes, you're, of course, you're all the time dealing with a funny dream that you're walking down the street and you see it, another way of doing a particular part of a story. And so this is this is what it looks like. I mean, so this is me, this is me working at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and you just do this. There's a lot of dreaming and then there's a lot of structure because the whole point of a novel is it's the structuring of your dreams. It's the creation of chapters and um, things you're going to leave out things are going to dramatize very, very intensely in great, and it's a sort of pattern. So, so, so dreaming is one thing, but the other thing is quite deliberate. And it's, it's, it's a sort of a structuring imagination is required as, as much as the dreaming is required. Thank you very much. Um, and the second question is, uh, Henry James and Thomas Mann were also biographers. I sense that uh, I'm just gonna put it down. I sense a jocular approach to the subject in James Hapmore in and in Manslot in Weimar. Would you like to comment on the biographer's sense of humor? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting that Mann wrote the book about Goethe, Lotte in Weimar. I, I used it to justify my own in, intrusion 
you know, as it were, into trying to imagine the life that maybe a biographer could do with knowledge and information, with footnotes in a very different way. And yet, yes, James James wrote a, a pretty bad book, actually, on the sculptor William Wetmore's story. It was commissioned by the family. James wrote it for money, even though he didn't need money at that time. <laughs> he had plenty of money, but he was always worried about money. He was quite, he was quite neurotic about money, uh, as his novels show. So he wrote that book for money. But the but I think Lottie and Weimar is a beautiful book about old age and desire and, and, and also a sort of desire that wasn't fully respectable. So that man was dealing with certain things that I think preoccupied him deeply, as indeed my books about man and James deal with things that I are preoccupied me deeply. But I was so glad that man wrote that Lottie and Weimar book because um, in Germany, especially, you know, critics were saying, how do you, what right do you have? What right do you have? You know, you, how can you imagine something? You weren't in the room. I said, oh, Lotte in Weimar, man, man did this. So thank, thank you very much for that question. I'm very glad to be able to answer. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Marta Grabowska. Um, uh, thank you for this inspiring meeting. May I have a question? Do you think that writing is about giving a say to people who didn't or don't have their say in reality? Um, I think it's been very important. Um, for example, in establishing a sort of entity called Ireland that might mean something. I think the figures of Joyce and Yeats actually did, in a way, give speech to something that was silent. And it happened, I think, with the women's movement. I think it happened really important, important ways in the 60s with figures like Simone de Beauvoir or Doris Lessing or Nadine Gordimer um, or Mary McCarthy, that there, were, that there were so many women writing about their own lives in a totally new way that I think really empowered women. And obviously it's happened with African-American um, experience with someone like Toni Morrison. It's happened with gay experience with someone like, you know, Edmund White, for example, in America has made such a big difference. So that I, I think, that, that, yes, there's a constant sense. Sometimes you're dealing, for example, in the novel Brooklyn that mm -hmm. I wrote, you know, mm -hmm. somebody like from my mother's generation, like my mother's younger sister, someone, those figures who went to America, she didn't go, but her, some of her friends did. And they simply disappeared into America. Their stories, they were too busy to write diaries. They wrote some letters home, but they didn't write novels. You know, so that there, there's a sense of that story hadn't been told or hadn't been dramatized. And so, yes, you are aware sometimes I'm writing a story that is not known <laughs> and I'm something submerged. And I think Jane Austen is, is a great figure who did it. You know, those women, those women's lives. Mm -hmm. Um, were, were not charted. They couldn't vote. They didn't appear in Parliament. Nothing they did or said seemed of any importance. And yet they emerge in those Jane Austen novels as immensely sensible, sensitive, interesting, textured people. I loved your reading of Mansfield Park. Uh, this is at the beginning of uh, The Way to Clear. I, I, love, I love the whole uh, book and I was quoting uh, a, a number of things from, uh, from the book today. But um, yes, sorry. Um, Question. Um, okay, we have another question from Sylvia Barnett. Uh, we talked today about strong mother figures, but I believe you said once that one of the core topics for Irish writers was the desire of, desire of patricide, or was the sense of relief when one's father is out of the picture only true for Wild, Joyce, and Yeats? Yes, I think that um, in the case of W.B. Yeats, um, his father was a great unfinisher. He could talk. Mm -hmm. You know, until the, uh, until until midnight, but he but he, he had real trouble finishing a painting. He could do a drawing and not a painting. And his two sons, Jack Yates, the painter, and W. B. Yeats, became great finishers. If you look at W. B. Yeats' stanza forms and the way in which the last line will clang, will, will simple. This is the ending. This is an authoritative, powerful ending which his father couldn't do. So there's a sense that as he was writing his own poems, he was doing something to, to his father. And, uh, and I think that's, that's also true in the case of, say, um, Oscar Wilde's going to London and th there's, his sexual scandal has so much in common with the sexual scandal that his father was involved in. And of course, um, Joyce did something different, which is that 
Ulysses really is about his father's generation. While Stephen Dedalus obviously is of James Joyce's generation, the older figures around Leopold Bloom, the singers, the chancers, the losers, the, the wits, the people who wander in Dublin, are figures who in 1904 were in their 40s, you know, or their 50s. So that Joyce actually managed in Ulysses to, to pay homage somehow to his father's generation. But that idea of relationship to father is one in Irish writing, I think in all writing really, that's tense and complex and that it, 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 there's no general rule governing it. In other words, each family seems to do things differently. Thank you very much. Okay, we're almost uh, um, uh, finishing. So um, I'd just like to, uh, at the end, uh, before thanking uh, our guests, let me just, uh, can I share screen? Yes, yes, you should. Okay, 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 okay. Mm -hmm. Disappeared, uh, let's, sorry. Why did my uh? You should do it without without any problems, because you one, one more you are a co-host. Yes, one more time, a screen share. Mm -hmm. One participant can share screen. Uh, nothing happens. Okay, now um, now something happens. Okay. Just at the uh, end of uh, our meeting, uh, let me um. Let me just uh, remind you and uh, let us see Anthony Cronin with his half smile. Uh, this is the second uh, Irish Literature Festival with Paul Darkin, uh, Leland Bardwell, and uh, Anthony uh, Cronin. Uh, this is Cronin who is reading uh, from his uh, uh, book of sonnets, The End of the Modern World. And as uh, Cronin was reading and preparing for the reading, uh, Paul Darkin was writing a poem about that very fact. I'm not going to read the whole poem, it's long, but the poem is dedicated to Anthony Cronin and it's called uh, A Poem in Poland. And it really is a, uh, a, a record, a poetic record of uh, Anthony Cronin reading uh, his poetry to, and this is a really beautiful image of the classroom, the lecture hall doesn't exist anymore. It's been renovated twice since. Uh, there are no Angle Poe's land that uh, Darkin mentions in the poem. Um, and of course, Cronin died uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, as a way of paying tribute to his interest in, uh, in uh, our faculty and our university, and also uh, to show you that poetry comes out of pretty much every single moment of our lives. Uh, this is Paul Darkin uh, re um, trying to uh, record a poet born in 1925 in the southeast of Ireland, circles to his feet, stand at the bar before the cramped into a tin can faces of students, sitting, crouching, squatting, standing. Their medieval iconic faces, chaotic, I opened. Uh, he is uh, a poet who was tramped here by way of airports, uh, two railway stations in Ireland, England, Poland. Uh, it, it is this tall angle for his land. So here's the history in, in the making. And he utters the last lines of his poem, a poem entitled The End of the Modern uh, World. And he compared us, the audience, uh, to pilgrims. Uh, and uh, Anthony Cronin uh, reading as the figure of uh, authority uh, with this, uh, with his iconic uh, voice. Uh, he, uh, uh, that is um, Paul Darkin, uh, who then read his uh, own poetry, dedicated this essay about Anthony Cronin's The End of the Modern World uh, to our uh, publication. And this is- Oh, that's amazing. That's great. I'll tell <laughs> Paul, I'll, I'll, I'll be seeing Paul at Christmas and I will oh, tell please, him that. Oh, please let, oh, yes, we uh, tell him that we remember him. Uh, yes. We uh, there is a number of poems uh, about Poznan, 
uh, he was also uh, participating in one of our conferences. And I remember he mesmerized the audience. He is a great reader of He is a great reader. And he yes. did a he, he delivered a lecture about uh, Michael Hartnett uh, with the, a number of kind of witty poems. Uh, there's one Hartnett's poem was when you wake up and you see Paul Darkin uh, holding your hand, do you know you are in heaven? And so so yes, please say hello to Paul. I, I, uh, I will Christmas. I will do that. And uh, tell him if he wants to uh, let him contact uh, us because we are remembering the Irish literature festivals all through the series of Irish literally milestones. I right. don't have his uh, his email address now. Um, but I can I, I can give I can yes, do please, that. Yes, please, please, please. We remember yeah. Paul. We remember Anthony Cronin. And we remember Eileen Bardwell. Right. And uh, and others, and every time with the with our meetings, we are uh, always uh, uh, trying to bring back the memories uh, from Irish right. literature festivals. I do That's hope wonderful. to be able to organize an Irish literature festival. Will you be the star? There's enough of books to talk about uh, uh, your books for three days and not uh, for an hour. So I do hope that it will be uh, possible to my students. Remember, guys, especially to Agata Stanisławska, who is using and who's uh, research searching uh, your novel, uh, Heather Blazing, and she, this is going to be part of her MA uh, and your other works as well. Uh, so for all, uh, for all our students, um, I hope this was uh, a really interesting uh, meeting with uh, someone who shared with you uh, his way of looking at the world, uh, literature, reading, and writing uh, literary history cultural memory. And with that, I'd like to thank you very, very much uh, for agreeing to uh, meet us today. Uh, we will be in touch uh, regarding other matters, uh, right. but uh, but I really do appreciate that you took your time for a way that, that you are working on something and you took the time to meet us and talk to us uh, today. Uh, so thank you, thank very, you much. Uh, very much. Thank you, yeah. thank you all thank you, for participating. Thank, thank you for coming. Uh, and thank we'll you. see you in uh, January uh, again, re uh, remembering Irish literature festivals. Say hello to all the writers in Ireland that we. I will do that. All and remember, okay. and especially to Paul, but a uh, poem uh, that was an honor uh, for all of us to have uh, you with us today. Well, thank you for having thank me. Thank you very much. much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.